Where's Fielder? He's gone to the dogs. Welcome, friends, and you are my friends. <laughs> this is Steve Fielder host of the Gone to the Dogs podcast. Of course, you knew that already. You you had to push the appropriate buttons and so forth and get online and figure out how to, how to listen to this. One of the things that I do most is to tell people how to find me and, uh, and how to listen to the podcast. But uh, you're here, I'm here, and we got a great guest again, one of our regulars, a gentleman that I always get good reviews when I bring him on, so that's why if I need a little bump in the ratings, I just call this guy Fred Moran, the Redbone Man from the great state of Pennsylvania. How are you, Fred? Well, not too great. I I don't know if it's this bad weather. Well, it ain't bad. It's just hot, (laughs) and it's got me down the dumps. I missed a couple nights this week. Just too darn hot to go. And I imagine quite a few other coon hunters. Jason Martin hunts every darn night of the week. He hunts seven nights a week. And I'll bet he's missed a couple nights also. He calls me about every other day, tells me how many possums and coons he trees and all that stuff. <laughs> you mean he yeah. admits up admits tree and the no, possum? He don't admit it. I'm just <laughs> saying that. Well, you know, there's an old country song that says it's too hot for to fish, and it's too hot for golf, and it's too cold at home. Now, that's a sad song, isn't it? Yeah, I, I, re, I was just singing a verse of that not too long ago to a guy. I says, it's even too hot to fish. That's right. That's right. Uh, well, that's my fam. My family left today for the beach. They'll be gone a week. My ki- uh, son, his wife, and the kids, and some of their other relatives, and uh, they'll be down there for about eight, nine days. I, I got two houses to myself uh, where I live in his house, and. Uh, He's got a hot tub at his place. I might as well just Uh-oh. go over there and spend the whole Uh-oh. day. <laughs> but, okay, uh, well, we're not going to go into that. I'm not going to ask you whether you're going to have company no, or not. It'll be, it, it's a terrible way. It's, it'll be solo. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, it is a terribly hot time of year, a summertime. Is when I lived in Michigan, it got really hot up there in the summer. Uh, you wouldn't think it being that far north, but it did get very, very hot. But I, you know, I was younger and I hunted every night that I could, you know, and I'd come oh, in my look. clothes, I could wring them out, you know, they'd be so wet with sweat. But oh, uh, that's the way man, it is I, here. I, I just don't do it anymore, friend. I tell you, especially where I live now. Ella and I went on a trip up to New Jersey. We were on the other st- side of your state. In fact, went up through Philadelphia coming and going. I wouldn't recommend that to anybody, really. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, I got a good friend that's 50 miles from uh, Philly in uh Williamstown, New Jersey, Timmy okay. Bruin. And, Is he a coon uh, hunter up there? Oh, yeah, a big-time coon hunter. His, his boy won a lot of big hunts, Redbone Days and a few others. Uh, they bought a lot of dogs off me through the years. In fact, probably, uh, I think the first dog I saw him, I'd say, was a good 50 years ago. And... He got a kill. He paid big money for it. He got a kill. I think the very first night he had it. Mm. I dare he complains there's too many roads. He said you can't get away from the roads. So. Well, I imagine that's true. But I was very surprised. Okay, the reason we went up is, uh, you know, Ella and I were high school sweethearts. I've told the story many times. We didn't see each other for probably thirty five years. Uh, then later on in life, we each were single, and we uh, got back together, and one thing led to the, the other, and and she's, you know, uh, Mrs. Fielder. But she has a daughter that lives in Hackettstown, 
New Jersey. Uh And uh, we went up there to see the granddaughter graduate from high school. She's done a great job. She's a smart gal, beautiful child, and she's going to Rutgers University this fall. So she's got her life pretty well planned out. But we went up there, and I've been up to Jersey a couple times before, and people would be surprised to be as close to New York City or Newark or whatever in those population centers. There's really some rural areas in New Jersey that are really beautiful. There's mountain ridges he, and valleys. He complains and, that there ain't enough rural area around his place. I, I introduced him. My priest is from New Jersey, and mm-hmm. he was a farm boy. Yeah. And they have an 800-acre farm that's still in the family. Oh, I man. just And I took Tim over there and introduced him. He, and Father Bump, B-U-M-P. Uh-huh. I, and I said, hey, uh, Father, how about calling some of your relatives that still run the farm and let uh, Timmy and them go down there and go hunting? I, I, I looked it up on a map. It was only about 60 miles south. And he got him permission to go, but Tim never took advantage of it, to my knowledge. Uh, I'd be down there every night, probably hunting uh, at only 60 miles. I think mean, still at, that's a good way, but it ain't too far for a coon hunter. And, uh, uh, absolutely not. I have to drive at least that far at that, here in Florida if I go. When I go coon hunting, sometimes it's it's nearly twice that far. So. I've been, hey, I've been in several states where the guys have, well, uh, Tommy Gorm in Alexander, Virginia. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's bought dogs off me for 50 years at least. And I, I went down his place one time. I said, I definitely would quit if I lived here. I said, you got to drive 40 miles to get out of town. I says, and it is bumper to bumper for 40 miles, all from Washington, D.C. traffic. And You know, that kind of takes you out of the mood. I, yeah, I've got it, a good buddy, uh, Mac Britt, that lives south of me in Ruskin, Florida. And he and I meet down near a little town called Parrish and, and all but. And we get out in the country, and it's decent hunting, not great, but decent. But going down the interstate 75 uh, toward around Tampa or going down U.S. Highway 19 to St. Pete and across the Skyway Bridge and all that, it gets you out of the mood of going cool yeah, hunting. Yeah, you wore out before you get there. Uh, yeah, for like sure. It. You know, when I, like I lived it. for 22 or three years, when I had 30 different drops I could make within 10 miles of my house. <laughs> uh, you know, so well, it's a big like difference. Like I there. tell Timmy, I says, I would never, or not Timmy, but Tommy Gorm, I said, I would never continue coon hunting if I lived in a place like this. Uh, getting out of traffic, especially in the winter when it's dark at five o'clock, and I li- I like to get in the woods as soon as I could. I go I turn loose a lot of times when it's just not completely dark. Uh, people don't think you catch coons, but you catch coons. That's one and, thing uh, I always enjoyed going to my grandmother's in Tennessee. You basically could turn the dog Is loose from the front. still down there where you, where you told me in the, in the area you were raised? Well, actually, my grandmother passed several years ago, uh, but my, uh-huh. my uh, cousin, my first cousin, owns that farm now and uh, lives there with her uh, husband, Eddie, and uh, they raised two children there, and now they have a granddaughter. Uh, but, uh, yeah, the farm is still technically in my family, although it belongs to my cousin. And, um, you know, yeah, you can still, they built Interstate 40. Where did you there. tell me you were, sis? That was yeah. just west of Nashville, Tennessee, a town Wait, called was Dixon. Town? Dixon. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I know a guy named Wayne Plant lives down in that I area. I got you. Mm-hmm. And uh, 
you're talking about uh, they were just building a highway, Interstate 70. They were building it, and I was in high school, and I was doing not it. Mm-hmm. And the watchman, they had a watchman there. And he used to let me park anywhere I wanted. I'd park in the middle of Route 70. Of course, <laughs> there's no traffic whatsoever. All right. And I had, there was a creek on the lower side. I used a tree a coon by the dozen uh, in there. That'd be perfect, wouldn't it? There's still probably a lot of coon there, but you can't hunt yeah. now. How many miles have we driven across the country, maybe going to Redbone Days? Are you going to oh, some I and wish. look and see those beautiful patches of timber off to the side from the interstate or going across 80, 90 there in northern yeah. Ohio and Indiana and all and look at that. Yeah. And I'd say, man, I'd love to turn a dog loose in there. But you can't do it. Even if you had permission, you'd be foolish to. I yeah. still have a picture of one I caught in the middle of 70. The dog's caught in the creek. It had a paw missing, a ear missing, half a tail. I, I thought, boy, if he could talk, he'd tell some stories. They called him lucky, I guess. <laughs> well, he wasn't too lucky that night. But uh, yeah. I I did some good hunting there, and uh, if I, it only well even if you hunt at three in the morning when there's hardly any traffic, it only takes one car. Just like a guy told me one day, he said, "Fred, I was hunting at he said an old dirt road way out in the country." He says probably one car a night comes, and that car come and got my dog. He said, that was the only car I heard all night. And sure enough, I go down the road, my dog's laying there at 2 in the morning. But you that's know, the way it goes. That's kind of like a tornado in a trailer park, you know. It, it seems yeah. like they always find a trailer park, and that one car will find your dog. How many yeah. times have we heard that story? It, it's I lost crazy. enough lately in the last couple of years, especially. This year, two of them took cars, and they were nice dogs, something I would have kept for a good while. And uh, But I'm down to only two dogs right now, and believe it or not, one's a walker dog. But uh, oh, and he ain't goodness. a bad dog. Uh, you I've know, got him off a friend of mine. A- there, let me interrupt you just a second. Go there ahead. must be an epidemic, a pandemic sweeping the country. I just um, recorded uh, with a father ton, uh, father-son team from Alabama that will be uh, on the week preceding this podcast, uh, uh-huh. Jamie and Trey Perrin, and uh, Jamie is a dyed-in-the-wool black-and-tan man. I mean has had them for years and years and loves a black dog better than anything. But what is he doing? He's hunting a walker dog right now. <laughs> <laughs> so I well, don't know what's going on. It must be a pandemic. Well, I didn't fall in love with no walkers, and I had, I've had i owned two that I could think of was better than this dog. But for what I got him for, he's a pretty good dog, and I, I won't have no trouble getting rid of him. Uh and they got rid of him for one reason. He was noisy. Mm. And I can't stand that. You mean it noisy on the day. ground when you turn him loose or in the kennel? In a, no, no, in the in kennel. Okay. Yeah. And in the daytime, if he sees you, he starts barking. Now, nighttime, he don't bark. Mm-hmm. But in the daytime, well, naturally, I did like most coon hunters. You either... Use a no bark or a shocker on him. Well, I put a shocker on him. Yeah. I run enough fire through him to light your house for a year. <laughs> and it 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 helped a lot, but it didn't help like I thought it should. Mm. Believe it or not, I start toning the dog. Mm-hmm. And I never had a shock him after. I just toned one time. He goes in the kennel, and that's the end of it. Uh, he well, listens to you know that than anything. Tr- yeah, that triggers the memory of that bad experience with the dog. Now, this is Steve Fielder talking. You won't find this in any training manual probably, and it may not be <laughs> accurate, but this is what I believe. You know, once you uh, 
have uh, actually, uh, I can't even think of the word I want to use. The dog has experienced that e-collar uh, situation. Then he'll associate that tone with that experience, and you don't even have to administer the... Uh, if they got any brains, that's usually the way it is. Yes. And that tone has been a remarkable uh, factor in training dogs. And, uh, you know, and I kind of got on to that a little bit years ago when I talked with a fellow named Archie Doré from Louisiana. And he talked to me about how little uh, stimulus he used on a Tritronics collar to get a dog's attention to to stop him in a deer race. He said, you don't have to light him up. You just need to get his attention. And if and you can do that with just a little bit of uh, of electricity. Uh, I know what and, you mean. And and then that tone replaces that. And and uh, the tones are an amazing thing. Uh that's basically um uh, I guess why the registries require two different kinds of collars on uh, on dogs. Uh, you know, if you if you use a training collar that has that e collar capability, then you can't run that in the night hunt, and you act, and you can't tone the dog in the night hunt uh, that way. But uh, uh, Anyway, I'm getting off on a rabbit path, but, yeah, that tone's an amazing thing for a dog trainer. I remember when Larry Packy first bought his first shocker. I, I, there I we said, go, folks, a Packy story. Said, what, what number are you on? He, I think it was nine. He said, on number nine. I said, don't you think you ought to start at all about half of that? He says, <laughs> Hey, it's a shock. He says, and I'm going to teach him I'm the boss. <laughs> well, <laughs> he did break the dog, but uh, yeah. that dog sure got a joke. I'll tell you that. Well, my uh, friend a- uh, Heath Hyatt, uh, I started Heath on his podcast journey by having him on on uh, a podcast with me, and he has his own podcast now, but... He's a dog trainer, and he talks about how just using that button a little, just like your irritation, just like somebody's pecking you on the shoulder. You know, if you mm-hmm. and I were standing at Autumn Oaks talking, and somebody came up behind you and just started pecking you on the shoulder, it'd irritate you, wouldn't it? And say, yeah, yeah. give me a minute here. You know, let me finish. <laughs> and you'd turn around to see who that was. Well, just that little bit of stimulation. You know, that little tap, 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 tap. Well, get a dog's attention, break his train of thought, get his mind off of chasing that off game or whatever. It's logical. It's logical. Yeah, yeah. Not all dogs, not all situations. I'll probably see you this year at Autumn Oak. Awesome. I sent an entry in first time in about three years or so. Well, you know, that's great. I'm glad you mentioned Autumn Oak. Well, I guess I did maybe, but... I wanted to do just a little bit uh, on that, um, and I'm glad to hear that you're going. My buddy down in North Carolina, he and I have the plot dog together. He texted me a while ago that he'd just gotten his entry in and got his room uh, lined up, something that I need to do right away. But Autumn Oaks this year is going to be August the 31st, September 1st and 2nd. It's always yeah. those three days before Labor Day, and it'll be there on Salisbury Road. Salis, yeah, Salisbury Road in Richmond, Indiana. And you mentioned Interstate seventy; it runs right through Richmond, and uh, pretty much all roads lead to Richmond, so to speak, because you can get in there off of virtually any interstate. It's about for those of you who may not know; it's about. Uh, a little closer to Dayton, Ohio, than it is to Indianapolis, Indiana, but it's in between those two, right on the Ohio-Indiana line. Um, I looked up a little bit, and uh, this will be the 64th running of the Autumn Oaks. 
1960 was the first one. Well, and, I went to the first one, and uh, well, I got I got lucky with my female. Uh, I was in with Brandon Berger's drum with my magic dog. Drum right? did a heck. He did a heck of a good job. He deserved to win it. And my dog did lousy that night of all nights, but it's that's all he went. A female I had back here at the time, I called her Midnight Sue, uh, and um, they were. I think they were just starting a grand nights at that time. They, there wasn't no grand nights. Well, yeah, the first year, first years of Autumn Oaks, there were uh, the grand night uh, right. degree. Well, had come she along. won. She won second in a night champion division. I think they picked three winners at that time, first, second, and third. She got she got second, and uh, a blue tick, uh, the guy don't even hunt anymore from about 30 miles from here, uh, he got third. Uh, he was a good dog. I run against him a lot of time. But the uh, guy's name was, I keep thinking, K E N T, but he, he don't coon hunt anymore. And one dog that was good, that blue dog burned out, and I guess he did too. So, I see. Well, it's it's nice of you to mention the fact that that winner of the first Autumn Oaks drum, Pioneer Drum, Dale Brandenburger, was a plot dog, believe that or yeah. not. Probably, uh, I don't know, I think a, a plot has won like maybe the registered hunt since then or whatever. But uh, uh, but anyway, yeah, that those are the good old days for sure. Um, it's, uh, I wanted to run down this just a second for the people who haven't been to Autumn Oaks before. It's a one-night hunt runoff in two nights. So all the scores from the two nights go together. Uh, I mean, you know, as if it were just a one-night hunt. But they've separated the Grand Nights out now. They have what they call the Grand Sixteen. Right. Yeah. And uh, that goes, those six, top 16 Grand uh, Night Champion cast winners from Thursday night hunt on Friday night and uh, end up you know, naming the National Grand Champion. Did you ever win the National Grand um, at Autumn Oaks, Fred? No, but my buddy Scotty Perky, the hunch with me, and I got him started at Red Bones. Uh, he won it one year. Awesome. Uh, and uh, he works for my kid right now. I just seen him this morning early. But uh, he... Um, uh, what the heck was I going to say? He well, uh, got his, his. He's a farm boy to start with, mm -hmm. and his dad stopped me one day on the road. He said, "I know you coon hunt all the time." He said, "I heard all about you." He said, "Why don't you take my kid coon hunt? He loves to go, but he he don't have nobody to take him, and give him a puppy if you got one." I says, I don't have no puppies, but you yeah, tell buy me. Yeah, buy him a light and a dog box and a pickup while you're at it. <laughs> well, listen to this. I had a young female. I called her uh, Pepsi. and Or no, I, I called her something else. He changed the name to Pepsi. She was about eight months old. She was running and training with the other dogs, but never done nothing great. I got up there that night. We went hunting, and the first thing I did, I told him, I said, you, that female, if you want her, you can have her. You can keep her. She'll make a dog. How good a dog is up to you, how much hunt you give her. Uh, I said, so, uh, but she, you'll see tonight, she'll run and tree with the other dog. First, first coon we treed, she treated by herself, split treed from the other dogs. I was sick, man. <laughs> I thought, oh, what did I do here? But I can't mm -hmm. take a kid. dog back off a 14-year-old kid. <laughs> so but you thought he, about it. <laughs> yeah, I did. And uh, 
He kept her killed. Well, he got her killed by corn when she was about oh, tall, nine or so. A uh, back road, country road, no cars, but one car got her. He raised a couple litters of pups, and he still got dogs out of that dog. Yeah, they go it. back to that dog. So yeah. He done quite well, and like I say, he won that uh, uh, dog box and everything else at the uh, uh, Grand Six team. And that. Yeah. He didn't. He didn't win a. I forget how it operates or remember. But I know he got a dog box, and he was in the top 16. Yeah, uh, well, that's the way they do it now, and then they have a runoff, I think, a Final Four, and uh, that determines uh, – I could be wrong, but I think that's the way to determine who the national grand grand night champion of Autumn Oaks is overall. But the high-scoring dog from each of the breeds, high-scoring grand, gets the national breed champion for that breed. Bro, he he definitely won that. Yeah. Well, it's good to see the red bones. I think they're kind of making a resurgence because – Hey, uh, uh, that uh, that red dog that red dog that just made Grand Night and everything else at seven months old. Mm. That's fantastic, oh, I think. Absolutely it is. You ain't gonna do that very often. No. And, and I'm I'm glad it's a red dog. <laughs> we had when we first got this plot pup and he showed out a little bit to start and we did get we our first goal was to make him night champion by a year old. He didn't quite make it. He was thirteen months and one day old. And that, then we thought, well, maybe we can make him grand by the time he's two. Well, he's just turning twenty one months old, and he's only got two wins toward grand night. So he's going to oh. have to step up the program. I don't think he's going to make it by the time he's I, two. I made. I made of him. I'm going to toot my own horn. Yeah. I made a female I called Mandy, a night champion at 10 months, one day old, 1959. That's awesome. Yeah. And that's... she held that record till this young male came along and beat her at everything. He broke all kind of records. Well, but that, she, that's uh, in the day when you had to have a first overall beat every dog yeah, in the hunt. Yeah. And the hunt numbers were were, were a lot stronger. Uh, you oh, know. yeah, definitely had a crowd. Uh, but I think uh, the hunts are starting to pick up a little bit. You know, it's, uh, as you said, it's summertime, yeah. and it's hot, and a lot of guys are well, back. There's a, hunt ton, there's a hunt tonight and one tomorrow. I'm definitely going to one tonight. It's close by. Good. And that's a, I ain't been to a hunt in a good while, but this will be the first one. I'm going to go to tonight. Now, are you going to hunt a dog tonight in yeah. the hunt? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah I right. don't go to. I don't go to look. I go to hunt. <laughs> and and remind my my listeners how old you are, Fred. Eighty six. Eighty six, guys. It is July. It is hot. It is Pennsylvania in the hills. <laughs> And eighty-six-year-old Fred Moran's out there hunting. you hunting a dog in a night hunt tonight. What is your excuse, right? <laughs> That's great, Fred. That's great. I'm, I'm glad to see you still enjoying it. And uh, you know, uh, I think a lot about uh, the fact that I can't do the sport the way I used to. And I think I, any. Do you I, think I always... about that at all? I always says when some, everybody remarks how good I go through the woods. Well, I don't anymore. I've slowed down a lot. And I, I told a guy one time, he said, man, you could fly through the woods. And I was probably in my 50s or 60s. He, I says, when somebody beats me to a tree, I'm going to hang it up and quit. Well, a lot of guys have beat me to the tree <laughs> since then. But I'm going to keep on trying. Sometimes those words spoken <laughs> when 
when that body's still strong and all, come back to It's in the us, mind, it? but it ain't yeah. in the body. <laughs> well, you know, that is a very sobering thing to think that there will a time come for all of us, everybody under the sound of our voices today, will reach a point at some time, if they live long enough, that they'll have to say, I just you know, can't do this anymore. And I'm talking about competition hunting. Now, right. I think most anybody, I, uh, a guy that that uh, always inspires me too is uh, Winston Aaron down in Mississippi. He's just turned 90 years old, and he's still hunting, you know. I don't know if he goes to night I'll hunts anymore. I'll tell you two, two guys, you, I'm sure you might know one of them, Harold Edwards from Alabama, yes. uh, B- mm-hmm. Birmingham, Alabama, Bessemer, Alabama. He's yep. 91. He tells me he still hunts three nights a week, but yeah. he's got property lease and he hunts off of a four wheeler all right. the time. But even though he's still out there three nights a week. Yeah, and, that's amazing. Yeah. And there used to be a guy, well, he's gone now. Uh, Harry Spots in Shelbyville, Tennessee. He he won. He's placed in the ACHA World Hunt when it was a real World Hunt, in my opinion. Yeah. And he placed a couple dogs. I had it with him. He had a big Chrysler car. He'd throw them dogs in the back seat, and off he'd go. Mm. And he was he was in his uh, late seventies when I hunted with him. And he he liked to hunt. He'd go darn near every night. He was in the horse business and that down there. And uh, Howard Ford used to get him Moran's down your way deer hunting. He's probably sneaking on your property. You better watch you don't shoot one of your horses by mistake. Are you talking uh, about Howard Ford from Tennessee? Yep. The one and only. Well, yeah. he's dead now. Howard Ford. I remember Howard so well. He helped us with the world hunt at Murfreesboro. Well, I'm and sure he, he did. He had a blue tick dog. Yeah, that's all he kept, blue yeah. ticks. Yeah, what a nice guy he was. and uh, He was a character. He, I'll tell you what, we oh, played so funny many man, tricks funny on man. him. <laughs> me and, me and Chilser used to go down there. Deer season in Tennessee comes in three different times. Like the first season for two weeks, goes out for a week or maybe 10 days and comes back in. for. We went down for all three weeks. I, I got a nice buck down there. Mm-hmm. In fact, uh, I won't say how many deer I've killed in my life, but it's the only one I ever got mounted. Uh, because I heard said, don't ever come back unless you get that deer mounted. <laughs> he thought it was so good. I've killed better ones up here, but but let, he is a good. Let me interrupt good, you good real quick before I forget. That Go dog ahead. he had was called Harpeth River Joe. Yeah. Right? Yep. He, he won uh, at St. Jude. He won a Ford truck with it. Uh, <laughs> that was the first truck ever given away. And he won. He won a free lease on it for a whole year, and then if he wanted to buy it, he right. could buy it. Right. And he ended up buying it. Well, let me let me tell you something real quick here. This young fellow that I hunt with now, Keston Jesse from Virginia, he says, Steve, I listen to the podcast and stuff, and I can't believe somebody will mention something, and you know that person, or you got, you you remember that guy, or you remember that dog's name. Or, and I said, Keston, it's like this. You know, I'm old, number one. I've met a lot of people, number two. But these people make an impression on me. These are people that, you know, that are memorable. You don't forget. You You don't don't forget forget people that, you know, that make a positive impression on you. And Howard Ford definitely was one of those people. But go ahead. You know, when we were down there, he had a bad heart. And uh, he didn't show it or act it. But he told me, he says, Monday, well, we were leaving on Saturday. He says, Monday, I got to go to the hospital. They're going to draw blood and check my blood for a heart. And so he fell over while they were drawing the blood in the hospital room. Later, he told me. 
And I never heard this before. He did die from heart failure. But he had 17 stints in his body. I never heard of that My before. My goodness. Uh, I'll that tell you who, who, him and Kerry Rooks are real good buddies. Mm -hmm. They they were good friends. That's so, a name. That's a guy I need to get on this podcast. Uh, he don't. He don't have time, that guy. <laughs> he don't have time. I he's know, too, but he's too also busy burying someone or talking about dogs. Right. Well, he's uh, uh, his name comes up so many conversations about good dogs. Uh, you hear about he's Kerry. had he's yeah. had more top dogs. Uh, he didn't make them all, but he uh, if he heard of a top dog, he would buy it. Yeah. I mean. He's bought plenty from me and a million others from other people. I'm sure. Well, we were talking about on moats, and you're going, and I think that's great. And, you know, this will be the first time that I won't be, at, um, you know, at a booth with uh, American sure. Cooner and Full Cry, as we know. I will say that— When's that woman going to take over? Pardon me? That woman that bought Full Cry, when she going to take okay, over? Okay, all right. Here, let's clarify that a little bit. One of the late, well, actually, Danny Doobie, her name is D A N I. Danny, yeah. she's the wife of Jason Doobie, and Jason works with W Hunting Supply, the sponsor for this podcast. He okay. li they live out in Oregon State. Yeah. But, yes, the, I don't know when the first uh, issue is coming out. I know that I, I'm glad you brought that up, Fred, because uh, subscriptions are available now. Uh, what they're going to do, at least to start, it will be six issues a year. So it will be out every other month. Other month. Uh, yeah, and I'm sure once this thing gets rolling for them, and I, I do really pray that it does because we need that that for our sport. Definitely, definitely. And I know that they have plans. You know, over the years, you know, Full Cry, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here with you because you know all these things. But Full Cry used to be a Coon Hunters magazine back in the day and hey, and then also that was you, the first book I ever got. Yeah. And uh I happen to be going through the mountains not far from where I'm at, about twenty miles further, and I seen a black and tan tied up on the dog box and I told my buddies, let's stop talk to that guy. And he naturally like all coon I was friendly and told you all about his dog. And he pulled out a full cry. He said, have you ever read this? I said, I never even knew there was a book like that. I'm guessing it was about 1951 or two that wow. I, and he gave me the book and I subscribed to it. And yeah. then later I subscribed to Merton Cooner. And well, I didn't even know it. George Slankard, uh, he did a more or less autobiography of himself. Uh, one time in one of his calms, and he was formerly from, he worked at Westinghouse Air Break, which is 20 miles from where I used to live. If I only knowed him then, I'd have took him coon hunting. And there, I know two coon hunters that worked at Westinghouse Air Break. Uh, and I don't know if he bothered with dogs at all at that time. He later moved from uh, Pittsburgh area uh, down to Illinois and then started that American Cooner in that. Well, but, a little uh, bit of history for people that may not know those names that you're mentioning. Uh, the Walkers, uh, Howard, I think his name was ha Howard, but his wife's name was Estelle Walker from Sedalia, Missouri, were the yeah. ones that produced the full cry for so many years. And Mrs. Walker was such a personable person. If you send an ad or a story or whatever, she'd send you a letter back, you know, or a, like a letter from home, you know, and tell you about right. how the garden was going and, and all that. And they really built that business and that magazine, which was 
it was the largest. You or, know. or she, yeah, definitely the largest. She, yeah. It used to be 246 pages. That'd yeah. be nothing. And then uh, later on, a guy named Seth Galt bought it and right. operated it for several years. And then Terry Walker bought it from Seth Galt. No, you miss one guy, George Slanker. No, no, that's American Cooner. George yeah, Slanker did not uh, own the full cry. No, no. Oh, I, I thought you were ta- including both of them. Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. Now, the American Cooner, somewhere back along the way, merged with Mountain Music, which was Eddie right. Ross's he, he bought Eddie Ross out, and uh, Eddie, well, he was hang it up anyhow. He had too many irons in the fire about other things. Eddie was a hell of a guy. Him and I got along good. He used to take me to Mississippi with him for two weeks and would coon out with T.C. Jones. Then we started, every year, we started a get-together. Uh, T.C. invite all his blue-tick friends. I'd bring five or six red bow men down there and would hunt, would hunt, get some old farm hand to, do all our cooking, clean up, and everything else. He bought us. We uh, rented some kind of old shack out in Holly Bluff, Mississippi. I got you. And we, we'd kill 30, 40 coon a night. We'd split up, you know, three guys go here, three guys. We had some damn good times down there. <laughs> I, well, you know. I'll, ne- I'll never forget my buddies coming back from the woods with. Squirrel tails out of his uh, uh, game bag. He must have had 15 in there. And a game warden pulled up. And he's talking to T.C. out in the field. And he says, all these guys got licenses, don't they? T.C. says, oh, yeah, they're all like, none of us bought the license. We just went down there and hunted. But those were the days. (laughs) Oh, and here's the best part. Listen to this. When we went down there, we I had a buddy, he said, now Chuck Hyger, he used to hunt with me all the time. And uh, anyhow, Chuck slept in the back. We had a cap on the truck. He crawled back there in the sleeping bag and slept all the way to Mississippi. When we get there at 2 in the morning, he's fresh as a daisy. We're wore out. We're going in there and uh, 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 get some sleep. Well, we rode around looking for T.C.'s truck. We heard and found a truck, but we couldn't hear his dogs nowhere. So Chuck, he got the truck and went back out on his own. He figured he'd turn loose and he would you three or two. And he did. And T.C. didn't come in with anything that night. And Chuck come in with a big coon from Mississippi, about 20 pounds. And he's laying in the sleeping bag the next morning about I get up no matter what time I get up. I get up real early. And it was about 7 o'clock, and this old black guy that's doing our cooking, and uh, his name was Arthur. He was such a comical guy. I got a kick out. And he's he's out there with a little wee wisp broom, and he's brushing coals or shooting out from the fire on Chuck's sleeping by. And he says, I said, what are you doing there, Arthur? He says, I'm brushing them coals off of Chuck's sleeping bag. He says, I got to take care of Mr. Chuck because he's the only honor we got. <laughs> Man, Be- he brought the only coon <laughs> in. <laughs> he was a yeah, character. Yeah. Well, yeah. you know, those experiences like that are so awesome. And uh, I, I hope that today's coon hunter... Uh, the younger fellows especially will will learn to to make relationships like that and get together and have camp. You know that's the reason why I go to White River every year. Uh, you know we don't go there to try to kill a ton of coons or anything. Uh, we yeah when it gets dark we're we're in the woods. Uh, you know yeah, that's you just a, have a good that, time with different guys. Uh, exactly. What we, we do uh, with two or three new guys that we never hung with mm-hmm. before, then go out with two new ones. And yeah. we'd do that, and then in the morning we'd compare what we did and what we got. And so 
But it, that mm-hmm. was the good old days. All these bluff Mississippi. It was a eleven hundred yeah. mile. For yeah, us. it's it. The, those trips are long, but they're certainly worth it. And especially yeah. when you get retired, when you have the time, I would encourage anybody that has the time to do so. And and um, you know, we can afford to do what we want to do. You know, uh, um, if we if coon hunting's most important, put a few nickels in the can and 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 save up and and go on that hunting trip this fall. Uh, you know, with some buddies and uh, uh, get that entire experience and make those we, memories. We played so many jokes on each other. I got to tell you <laughs> this, and before I go, uh, uh, there was a friend of mine that went with us, Chuck Bailey. He's deceased now. He moved to Wyoming, quit coon hunting and everything else. He retired from a long haul trucking for uh, some. I forget who now. But anyhow, he always wore, not because his name was Bailey, he always wore them Bailey cowboy hats. And they're expensive. They're one of the better hats. Well, we're out squirrel hunting one day. DC had a real good squirrel dog, and we all used him. I later bought him off at DC. I think we killed 57 squirrel with him in four days. And, um, spotty right? anyhow we had a bad day we went out and we didn't see nothing he he says hey moran throw your head up let me see if i could hit it i had just an old cheap two dollar hat on i don't know what kind of what he shot at it i don't even remember if he hit it or not but it came down on the ground i said throw yours up let me get a shot at it he threw that good fancy Bailey hat up. I had an automatic. I emptied the gun, and when it came down on the ground, I finished emptying the gun. I, he's chasing me up the road because I ruined his hat. He <laughs> said, and the, the other guy that was with us, Jack Cottrell, he says, "Them guys are nuts." And we get back, and Chuck goes into the camp where old Arthur's in there cleaning up and that. He says, Arthur, look at this. I was walking up the road, and someone ambushed me out of the woods. And look how they shot up my head. They almost got my head. And old Arthur, serious as could be, he just looked at that, and he shook his head, and he said, Mr. Chuck, I, I sure would get to law after that man. <laughs> uh, it was so comical. Uh, we he had was some buying good that time. story, huh? Yeah. Uh, we had some good times down there. Well, you but, always will and uh, when you get together with a group of coon hunters, that's for sure. Uh, back to talking just a little bit about those magazines, Um uh, you know, Eddie Ross had the Mountain Music, and then that was purchased, I guess, by George Slanker because they incorporated them both into the one magazine. And right. and George owned the American Cooner for many years. Uh, he and Fred Miller didn't get along. They didn't right, particularly right. like each other, Fred being the president of the United Kennel Club. And I think that all stemmed mainly over – the effort to try to create a National Coon Hunters Association. And uh-huh. I guess they had a meeting at Autumn Oaks, and they couldn't decide who was going to run it. Was George going to run it or Fred going to run it? And they were both strong personalities, you know. And and so uh, anyway, uh, all of that. I remember George Slankard. Uh, in fact, George Slankard called me one day. I was living in Michigan, working at UKC. I'll never forget, I was on the deck uh, grilling some some burgers or steaks or whatever. For And uh, I got a call, and it was George Slankard. And I thought, well, George, why? It's interesting to hear you because I knew that American Cooner and Coonhound bloodlines were kind of, you know, competitors, off. you know, right. and all. And so I thought, well, now what? You know, I've always been kind of a skeptical person. Uh, and I think 
you know, what's the backstory on this? You know, what what's the underlying thing going on here? So he says, well, I think you need to call the secretary of uh, American Kennel Club, AKC. Uh, they want to hire you uh, to run their coonhound program. Mm-hmm. And I thought to myself, why, if American Kennel Club wants to hire me, why are they not calling me? <laughs> I always thought that George was trying to get me at odds with my boss, Fred. Uh (laughs) And, uh, you know, and so I didn't, I just kind of blew it off because I was quite happy at UKC at that time. And, uh, and I just kind of blew it off, but I always wondered what George had, uh, you know, up his sleeve there on that deal. But, you know, in later years, I remember seeing George. He would come, like, to Flora when, uh, you know, a lot of coonhound events are held in Flora, Illinois. In yeah. fact, the plot people just had their plot days there here back uh, a couple well, of Well, of course, he's weeks. close by to it also. Yeah, and he's very close there at Cesar, Illinois. But George came out. He got out of his car. He put some magazines on the hood of the car. He got back in the car, sat there for about a, no, he sat there, I'm going to say probably, I'll give him credit maybe with an hour, and got out, put his magazines back in the car and drove away. (laughs) So to say he, he wasn't very much involved in the later years. And then, of course, when Terry... Walker bought American Cooner, and then he bought Full Cry from Seth Gold, and he bought the Rabbit Hunter magazine, and he bought the Hunter's Horn at the Foxhound Registry. And, uh, you know, he got involved. Terry was very, very much involved, uh, bought coon hounds, had handlers out there handling these dogs and all. And, uh, of course, a shout-out to Terry Walker, I know that he is now uh, discontinued Full Cry in American Cooter Magazines uh, and The Rabbit Hunter. Uh, one of the ladies at the office in in uh, Cesar there, uh, Linda Scott, has purchased The Hunter's Horn and from Terry and will be operating it going forward. And wow. Terry is staying on for a couple of years, he says, to help with the transition and right, all. So right. that, that magazine's going on. But as you mentioned there, uh, Jason and Danny Doobie, uh, that are with the W Hunting Supply Organization, uh, I think it should be noted that DU Supply is not the owner of Full Cry or not buying Full Cry. This is an enterprise that, that the Doobies have, uh, have taken uh-huh. on. But... Um, that's spelled D U B Y, uh, and uh, okay. great, great people, uh, just fantastic oh. people, and I really wish them well. Uh, right away, I I bought a subscription because, uh, you know, <laughs> I thought the the thought came to my mind at first when people got online and started complaining about. Full Crime Magazine, an American Cooter Magazine. Would they charge you for a pers- uh, or subscription? You know, I think it's... A, I imagine it, they're going to announce it in... Yeah. In, I don't know the exact number, but it's going to be around $30. But I don't know okay. the exact number, uh, Fred. I, uh, like I say, I still had... Probably a year to go on mine. I don't know. Mm. It don't matter to me. Well, but I'll say, I don't know what the arrangement. They want it. You can find them on Facebook, or I can get the number for you, and you can call them and see. And I'm sure they'll. I'll work. tell Patty. She does that Facebook yeah. all the time. Sure. Well, so anyway, I do. I just wanted folks to know that Full Cry is going to continue as a bi-monthly. Uh, it'll be out every other month, and they do plan a full. They're going to do uh, coon hounds, 
competition, pleasure hunting. They're going to have a history section when they're going to go Probably back. Probably a and little get, bit of everything. A, a little bit of everything, but uh, it's going to be in color, uh, which Full Cry has traditionally been a, a black and white magazine. Uh, right. And I know that they're going back into the vault, as we say, and getting some of the old stories like the O.L. Beckham stuff and all that and they'll be republishing some of that so it uh-huh. should be should be a lot of uh interesting stuff in there and i'm really looking forward to getting it myself yeah, i can't wait to see what they put on yeah absolutely, uh, absolutely. i bought some dog supplies through through them i think a caller or two i think yeah oh, and yeah. I, I mean a tracking caller sure uh, well but, uh they, they treated me okay Oh yeah, and, uh, they're good folks. They're I good. Go, I go along with all of them as far as that goes. M- Mrs. Walker was like a grandmother to everybody, <laughs> right? And and she knew how to treat people, and they treated her the same way. You know that uh, was uh, the American Redbone people, I believe it was, held Redbone Days in Sedalia. They did. I was there. Yeah, and that was the. That was the occasion that I met Mark Zepp. Mark was there <laughs> to interview with John Wick to go to work with Wick Outdoor Works, which he did uh-huh. and worked with John for many years. But Mark was there. That's the first time I met the tall guy from Ohio. Hey, and he's, he's been my house four or five times. Yeah, he and I have become really good friends over good the years. Honest guy. Absolutely. Good honest guy. Absolutely. And uh, one of the things that Mark has done to help with this podcast as he had, has uh, provided some of his lifetime coon squalors. And we've been, every week, we've been having a drawing on Facebook. A guy just was hunting with me last, either last night or night before. He says, he says, uh, he's heard me blow a squalor and so forth. Uh, I, I made the coon look. And he says, what kind of squalor you got? He said, I says, here, look at it. And uh, he says, I got the same kind. I said, but it, I said, turn it all around and read it. He turned it around and on it and says, Fred Moran, number five. <laughs> and when I got that as a gift from Mark, I called him up. I says, I want to know why I ain't number one. <laughs> <laughs> and he says, well, believe it or not, my mom's number one. I said, she don't coon on. <laughs> he says, well, family, man, family. Dad's number two. I knew yeah. probably, I didn't ask him all the way through, but I knew Harold Hoffmeister would be That's number three. A, oh, yeah. Uh, because that was his buddy and oh, yeah. best buddy. But at least I got recognition. Absolutely. I'm number, I'm number five. So. Well, the other, sh- other day, a gentleman from down in Georgia, I'm going to know he lives in Alabama on the at Phoenix City, uh, this Chuck... Pudell, and he's been writing some really good stories on uh, on my uh, Facebook group called uh-huh. Coon Hunting Conversations, and he's a Redbone guy. He's a retired lieutenant colonel from the Army and uh, writes a lot of good stuff and, and all, uh, but uh, I, I just got off on... Oh, he was asking online about the Purina race and what were some of the dogs that had won it and why is it Purina not having that Purina competition anymore and yada, yada, yada. So I went back and he was asking for some old winners of that who who had won it in the past. Of course, as a Redbone man, you know that the famous Amos dog, Roger Shavers, won it. Uh, one year, and we presented that to him in Nashville, Tennessee. I remember that very well. But at any rate, uh, I pub, uh, posted some pictures from a book that UKC 
published for their 100th anniversary. Did you get one of those books, Fred? No, I don't think so. It's called The Centennial. How long ago would it That been? would have been in 1997. Fred Miller, uh, UKC was f- uh, founded in 1898. Well, I thought, basically, that The Centennial book would come you know out what? in 1990. I, I, I think I did get some. Was it called the Parade of Champions or something? Well, they started out with the Tournament of Champions and then went into the Purina race, but this was called The First 100 Years, and it's the centennial book for UKC uh, for the first 100 years. And they post, uh, published them in paperback, and they had several of those, and they had when they had the centennial celebration at the fairgrounds in Kalamazoo. Well, that was my last year at UKC, but Fred Miller had a few of those done in uh, leather bound, uh, hard bound uh, oh. copies. And uh, I, I was uh, honored really because I got number, uh, they were signed copies by Fred and mine is number three. So I figured he probably kept number one, and I figured (laughs) probably Sarah Jonas, who was with Fred, was at UKC when Fred bought the business in 1973. I figured Sarah probably got copy number two. two. But I was uh, honored to have that, and I do, I, I have it here with my stuff. I don't know what, you know, it's going to make a big dumpster load one of these days when I'm gone for somebody to get up. You know, all that stuff, when I sold my house and moved up here, I called two different coon clubs, told them, come down to my house. I said, take every trophy you want. You can have them, use them for club hunts or whatever. And this is a God's truth. I think I'm guessing that he, each club took at least a hundred. Uh, Blairsville Club and the other one was the club I belonged to, Laurel, Laurelville. I threw 650 trophies in a dumpster. I wish I had that entry wow, back that's all a at lot. one time. <laughs> one time I could buy Cadillac Eldorado. <laughs> <laughs> and go to town. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Oh, uh, well, well the good Freddie. old days. The good old days. Well, well I, I tell you what, we're going to get together at Autumn Oaks and we'll do some more recording. All while right. We're uh, there, I'm sure. I, I wanted to uh, just mention something before I let you go here about the podcast. I'm just looking here, and, you know, this is the third podcast that I've been involved in. I. Uh, Chris Powell and I started the Houndsman XP podcast, and I guess that's been probably close to four years ago now. And uh, then I had the uh, idea to do this Nightlife Nation podcast and contacted Nick Gilliland, and he in in turn wanted me to contact Brent Reeves. And we started the uh, Nightlife Nation and did that for a while. And then... uh, at the request of uh, W Hunting Supply, uh, they asked me to come on their network. And I was a little, uh, I didn't know if I wanted to tackle the thing by myself or not. But uh, it's worked out fairly well. And and we're going to be celebrating the 100th episode of this podcast. Uh, the date will be September the 27th. Uh, uh, no, 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 no. Let me go back. The uh, the 100th episode will be on August the 28th. That's uh, just three days before Autumn Oaks. So uh, we'll be at Autumn Oaks and have a booth there and be recording live from Autumn Oaks. Well, I know year. where to find you then. I'll be right there in the headquarters building if they do it like they did last year. It'll be there in the Coleman Center where they used to have everything before they built 
the big building, and that's where the UKC headquarters is and where they call all the casts and all that. So we'll be right there. Listen, I know you've got a lot of political pull with all the coon <laughs> hunting events and that. I mean, to make automotive the best there ever was, Tim plants some trees. That's plant what they need there more there than that anything. <laughs> You know, they have free camping there, and there's a lot of ground, but there's very few trees there's on no that ground. Sh- no yeah. shade for a dog. Yeah, that's, that's true. I- that's a good idea to mention to people that are coming and bringing dogs to bring uh, those portable canopies, you know, to create yeah. your shade for your dog there. But at uh, any rate, uh, to back up, I did the first episode of Gone to the Dogs was on September the 27th of 2021. And okay. then uh, we're going to do the 100th episode will be on August 28th. So that's just something to look forward to. Uh, this episode today will be at our 95th, Fred, and that's going to air on July 24th. So, July 24th. I'll tell, yes, him, I'll tell my buddy JJ. He said, <laughs> I don't see you on there no more. And uh, I says, uh, I'll let you know when I hear something. Well, call so, the fan club for sure. because July 24th. I'll tell him. Well, the next time I get together with you, and I was going to do it today, but we've kind of run out of time here. We've been uh, at this an hour and five minutes already. I did a little research back to all the towns that I've been to around the country and where the best restaurants in these coon hunting towns were. I know and, them too. And I wanted to talk about that a little bit, but we'll save that for a future episode. Okay. But Fred, thanks for coming on with yeah. me. Hey, I hope you're feeling better. I uh, enjoyed it. I hope you have a good weekend and we'll see you at Autumn Oak. I absolutely. That's Fred Moran, the Red Bone Man. No place I'd rather be than out there under one of those big shade trees in Pennsylvania listening to one of those uh, uh, Red Bones tree, Fred. And I hope to do that. Uh, <laughs> Me before, too. Before Me we too. get Before we get too old to do it. All right. Take All care, right. Fred. You take care, Fred. It's great to talk to you. Folks, That's going to be a wrap for the podcast for this week. Uh, Again, I'll remind you, we do a a spin on the Wheel of Names each Monday at 6.30. The way you get your name on the wheel is to correctly answer the question of the week that is posted on my Facebook page, Stephen F. Fielder. And uh, correctly answer that. Send it to me by private message. We'll put you on the wheel. The winner gets a Zep Lifetime Coon Squalor, a Gone to the Dog sticker, a W Supply lanyard, and uh, just look for that each Monday at 6.30. Folks, if anyone asks you, where's that old coon hunter? Well, I just tell them, he's gone to the dogs.